Um, we'll perhaps move on to the forming of limited editions. Oh, right. Yes, sorry, I've lost the track. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, actually, there's a few little steps before that, isn't there? Like there um, is, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah I, I worked in... Your first jobs. Yes, yeah. first jobs. I, I was saying before, I don't didn't actually understand what, um, what was available to me when I left school. I really didn't know anything about jobs and what there was, and uh, my father had made me take shorthand typing. And so I... Um, I got a job in a, in a shoe house, uh, Marla Shoes, and I spent three years as the house model there. So I would start with the shoes and then run out and buy something that was fabulous. And they do um, wacky prototypes and wacky designs uh, on these shoes that would never sell. So I, because I was sample size, they'd end up with the shoes. So then I'd go out and try and find something that had orange and pink and purple in it so that I could match with my shoes. So I had lots of fun in those years of being really having the most amazing and different shoes. And then I moved from there to Amco Jeans. And Amco Jeans was denim and um, uh, really an exciting time in the 70s, early 70s, when um, denim was a king and everybody was wearing it. And Amco Jeans was one of the peaches jeans, you know, that was the peaches bottom jeans. <laughs> that was my bottom sometimes in those ads. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and so I was the fashion house model, and a house model, I need one every day in my life. They're a really important person, they, you, you know, you try things on and they, um, you know, you, even when I was wearing the shoes, you have to fit everything and tell them where it pinches and, you know, or whether, where it's too tight or too, the rise is too short. You learn a lot, actually, a great deal about being a fashion model. You learn a lot about garment construction, so probably I started absorbing at that point. Mm. Um, I met my husband there and we ended up being together and he left Amco um, and when we went on a trip to Europe. When we came back, he um, joined Sasson Jeans. And Sasson Jeans were the 80s uh, amazing, iconic brand because they took the gene which had been very much based on the historical Levi gene which was straight and they took the gene and made it baggy and it was like a very big sensation. And the two guys that owned Sasson jeans in New York and America, they were very, um, they had a very rock and roll. They had a rags to riches story and it was amazing and they were multi, multi millionaires and we got carted around by them in New York. and You told me a story about Duran Duran, which caught my ears because yes. I was a fan in the um, 70s, yeah. 80s of them, well, um, coming to New Zealand. Yes, so they <laughs> bought, they bought uh, Duran Duran was their, um, the, I guess, their brand maker. And so Duran Duran had Drum, which was sponsored by Sasson Jeans out of, Eng um, yeah. yes, out of, um, America, but they were an English band. And so Simon Le Bon came down and um, he was wicked. And my husband and I um, were looking after him and hosting him and we had a yacht. We were shooting a Sasson ad for worldwide coverage in the Bay of Islands and we had this new and exciting young model who'd never really been used before. And it was before the Tip Top ad, but we had Rachel Hunter on the boat shooting the Sasson ad and uh, she was, you know, mm. just so gorgeous back then. And um, But he was wicked and horrible and made lots of headlines. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. But yeah, we had a little bit of rock and roll, but I lived on the periphery of everything that my husband did. Um, and he had a very powerful role in fashion in, in those days with, his, with this brand and um, travelled all the time. I decided to have my own business with a friend and it was in employment, it had nothing to do with fashion. But I travelled with him, it allowed me to travel, it allowed me to shop a lot because I made good money at it. And so I would travel with him and I would be this in this constant um, state of frustration I had a burning desire, that's always important when you have a dream, to do, um, uh, to be involved in fashion directly for myself, but I didn't quite know how to go about it. And I did personal growth and all sorts of things in the 80s, that new age stuff. <laughs> and, um, but it was very good for me, I needed that. And um, I managed to find a way through to actually have my dream, my own dream and of fashion. And I guess I started off 
really with this dream. I wrote it down. I wrote every small detail down, and I began it, and I took one step after another, and I began this dream. I was completely untrained. I had no idea, really, what I was letting myself in for because being on the edges of his fashion life s is completely different to actually... Um, having garments cut and made and buying fabric in Italy. and But that's exactly what I did. I went to Italy and I went to these beautiful old mills. And I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I, I trained myself. I remember you saying, though, that it really honed your eye going on those trips because mm. the, you would see your husband and the buyers making decisions. And mm. you made your own decisions, didn't you, with your personal clothing? Yes. And you said m more often than, than not, Trelise would would choose a garment, bring it home and wear it and then they'd put it into production because everyone wanted to know where she got that from. So they were very much that, or they would go and buy ideas away and copy them and, um, and add them to the collection. And so I would go and I'd go, oh, what are they buying? That, that is so boring or that is so like, and I, but I was not allowed an opinion particularly. I might quietly say it to my husband, but he wasn't the designer, so he didn't really... Um, influence it greatly but I guess I felt dismissed most of the time and that really frustrated me and um, but then when they would say oh you know that's amazing pant you're wearing can we borrow that I'd like okay and then it would become a bestseller and I'd like see I knew <laughs> <laughs> and um, mm. I guess that for me was mm. where I had had some um, indication that I, uh, you know, my sense of what would work on a woman was right. And I mm -hmm. guess it was because they were totally male choosing for women, which has been a lot of the industry in New Zealand for a mm -hmm. long time, back, back right. in the 70s especially. Yes. Um, it was very male-dominated choosing for women's fashion. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm.